Hey guys, it's September 30th and that means October starts tomorrow. And that means that Lilliputian living begins. So if you guys are new and you haven't done a Lilliputian living with me, I use October as a 31 day month long challenge to create a character, to design a prompt and to ink that character every day for the entire month of October. And this is my fifth year doing it. So if you guys want to check out the first four years, they're available as a compendium stupendium, which you guys can find in the Natto shop. Or you can check out the first four years on Instagram using the Lilliputian living hashtag. So I don't actually have enough internet access to post things to Instagram right now. I am currently evacuated, but I will be sharing them daily, at least trying to share them daily on Twitter and on my YouTube community tab. So if you guys enjoy tiny people, if you guys enjoy art and illustration, if you enjoy daily world building and character design, I hope you guys will check out all 31 of the illustrations I'm going to create this month. And this year, the challenge is even greater. Every year life throws, every year I've done the Lefusion Living, life throws some like weird hiccup at me. This year it threw Ida. So it's gonna be really hard to do this, like no lie, because we have to drive 30 minutes just to find internet right now. I've never done a Lilliputian living without having internet access because I rely heavily on it to, you know, look up like how to, how to draw certain flowers. Like that was year three of Lilliputian living or how to draw the sort of clothes Lilliputians would wear, which is heavily inspired by like pioneer living. So, or even colonial living but there's also some modern fashion thrown in as well. So, you know, I rely heavily on Townsend's and Pinterest and Google for that, which I'm not going to have access to this year, or I'm gonna to have to plan way in advance. So uh, this year's theme is gonna be daily life. So year one was different jobs, occupations, and trades. Year two was kind of a mishmash of like general world building stuff like pets. Um, like families, like different types of Lilliputians. Year three was an herbal, the different kind of plants they utilize. Year four was how they repurpose human things. And now this year we're exploring daily life. So it's gonna be a variety of just kind of Lilliputian living things like foods, the types of houses, what types of household chores, that kind of thing. So um, every year I've kind of got hit a routine now for how I like to do this. Every year, I buy myself a brand new Strathmore visual journal, the mixed media kind. So this is the like series five. It's got the cotton rag vellum finished paper. Uh, most years, I like to do my underdrawing with a pink color, you know, or a blue color, you know. This year, uh, kind of because I don't have internet access, so if I run out, I can't reorder any. I am using a 0.5 mechanical pencil with Pentel red lead in it because I can get that at Walmart. I am going to, I prepared the other things in advance. I have a extra fine and a medium pigment Pentel brush pen for filling in spot blacks. I have several Sakura Pigma FB, why did I do that? Several Sakura Pigma FB brush pins for the fine lines. I've got a variety, I don't know why I have that in there, a variety of erasers. And I've got some refill leads and I've also got some post-it notes so I can do thumbnail sketches and the way I usually do Lilliputian living is I do a thumbnail design and a sketch the day before ink it and then do the next thumbnail sketch and you know well thumbnail design and sketch for the next day so I'm always trying to be one step ahead because the don't break the chain method of working works really well for me where I'm always finishing up yesterday's stuff. So that breaks the, that starts, that keeps momentum going, that breaks the inertia and then starting the next sketch. So I'm just always kind of trying to tumble forward with my momentum. In fact, I already have tomorrow's sketch done. Let me show you guys what I'm going to be inking tomorrow. It's sideways this time. Usually I like to keep it in portrait format, but I mean, a sleeping kitten inspired by Dax, actually literally referenced from Dax. 
and a toddler Lilliputian are our day one. And I think this would make a good sort of front page introduction illustration for Lilliputian Living Volume 5. Since who doesn't love cats? I love cats. Also, I am frankly exhausted and I wanted to do something that was kind of easy and yet also featured cute cats. So there you go. But uh, tomorrow I'm gonna start diving into cooking. So I think I'm gonna start with pickled crawfish, which sounds delicious to Kara, but not so delicious to us. So this is my sketch. I'm using the red lead this time. I think I'll still be able to easily drop that red as long as I don't have the contrast up too high for the red itself once I've inked it and scanned it. And the cool thing about Lilliputian Living is it basically uses up this whole almost this whole sketchbook since I don't draw on both sides of the paper and it leaves just enough if I need to do some additional spot illustrations to kind of fill out the zine because Lilliputian Living volume one and two were released as zines volume three and four were also supposed to be but they ended up or maybe I did do no I did do three so volumes one through three were released as handmade zines laid out using Affinity Publisher. And then the Compendium Stupendium, which includes all four years at that point of Lilliputian living, was laid out in InDesign and we printed it through CreateSpace. So uh, I guess technically there's a print version of all of those. And what I'd like to do, just kind of depending on my mood and, you know, how this goes, even though we're on year five, I'm kind of hoping to make it 10 years of Lilliputian living because I'm a really big nerd. That'll give me two volumes. So I can do, or I guess I should do eight years because that would give me two volumes. <laughs> I don't know why I said 10 years. Anyway, um, I, I want to uh, scan it, lay it out, and sell it as a handmade zine until I have enough to do another compendium stupendium because I'm just a glutton for world building. But anyway, so let me show you the inking tools I'm going to use for this. We have our Sakura Pigma FB. So you can see it is a really fine point brush pin and it happens to also be alcohol marker proof and waterproof. I have my Pintel pigment brush pin and I just happen to really love how these ink and I really love the like quality of the ink. It's got this really rich kind of black. And then we have a medium version of that just for filling in larger areas. So I can't wait to show you guys to ink with you guys. Well, probably not going to ink this with y'all tomorrow because I got a lot to do tomorrow, but I will definitely share the finished inks with you guys tomorrow. And hopefully I can at least make, I'd like to do time-lapse versions or time-lapse segments for a lot of these, but hopefully I can at least show you guys what I did each day. So this is for tomorrow, October 1st. And it's just a nice, sweet little depiction of a Lilliputian child with the kitten that her family is raising. So day one is one of my only sideways Lilliputian living sketches. It is a toddler sleeping with the family kitten. I used Dax's reference for this. This is this was completed when we still were staying at my mom's house. We still didn't have internet. And I gotta tell you guys, doing a month long drawing challenge without being able to reference things is so oh, not, not my favorite challenge. So basically what I would do is I would create a thumbnail of what I wanted my illustration to look like. And then while we were out and about during the day, and I could get a little bit of internet, I would start Googling all the things that I thought I would need to draw. And then hopefully by the time I got home, I would have enough reference to be able to complete them. So it was definitely not the way I would normally do Lilliputian living. Let's call it hard mode. So this is day two. We're talking about foods here. So this year's theme, every year I have a different theme. This is the fifth year. This year's theme was just kind of everyday life. So I wanted to depict some of the aspects of Lilliputian living that never really got covered in volumes one through four. So this is pickled crawfish. Crawfish are captured, boiled, and pickled in homemade fruit vinegar with spices to keep them shelf stable. Later, they're braided and fried and served piping hot, a favorite treat for many Louisianian Lilliputians. And this one was actually based off of Joseph because, like I said, got to work with the reference you've got. Thank you. 
Here is day three, dandelion salad and fritters. And I watch a lot of survival YouTube. I watch a lot of cooking YouTube. So I bring, and I've always been interested in living off the land and kind of survival eating. So I bring a lot of that into how I develop the Lilliputian world and how I write Seven Inch Kara. Cause that's been an interest I've had since I was a really little kid reading My Side of the Mountain and Hatchet and dreaming of the day I could go live out in the woods and live off the land. As an adult, I don't think that's nearly as feasible as I did when I was a kid, but it's something I'm still really interested in. So there's the dandelion salad. You can eat the leaves, you can eat the heads, or you can bread and fry the flowers to make these fritters. And I think Atomic Shrimp actually demonstrates that. And this one was based off of me working with the reference that I have. Here's day four, sparrow eggs. Fried, pickled, hard and soft boiled, omelets are for baking, wild bird eggs are an important part of many Lilliputian diets. Never taking more than needed, a single egg can easily feed two Lilliputian children. And one of my friends from afar volunteered to be day four, so I drew her and I drew her cat. Day five, I used my mom as the reference here. And this is blueberries and blueberry cobbler. So being kind of, kind of stressed out this whole month, some days have prompts, some days don't. As I cobble this together into Lilliputian Living Volume 5's zine, I'm gonna make sure all of them have fleshed out prompts. Day seven is acorns. This might look recognizable to you. These, this is little baby Kara, her father Rowan, and her mother Meldina, way back when Kara was just a wee baby. And today's theme is acorns. Acorns are an important staple in Lilliputian diet, but they require a lot of processing to remove some of the bitterness. Bitter tannins must be leached before eaten whole, ground for flour, made into mush, or used for their oil. And here's day eight sketch, minnows. Pickled, dried, smoked, or fresh and fried, minnows are an important part of the Lilliputian pantry. Fished or trapped in ditches, ponds, or lakes, minnows can be preserved to last through colder months. So a lot of how I envision food for Lilliputian living or for the Lilliputian world is most of it has to be consumed without refrigeration. That's just not something most of them have access to. So things either need to be consumed as they are, shared with neighbors, or preserved in some way to last through the leaner months.
Day nine is strawberries. Fresh jammed dried, strawberries are a tasty treat that if preserved can be enjoyed year round. Day 10 is gumbo, and we have our gumbo being cooked in a huge, huge, for Lilliputians, it's actually just a tin can, but it's huge to them, in a huge pot over a fire. Gumbo isn't necessarily served at home, but it's a popular gathering food. Perfect for cooler fall weather, everyone brings a little something, rice, okra, onion, shrimp, and the end result can feed a lot of Lilliputians. And this year for Lilliputian Living, I really wanted to bring a lot of Louisiana culture into it. So now we're starting on chores. Day 11, daily chores, gathering firewood. Generally, Lilliputians are all about conserving their energy and not attracting human attention. Firewood and kindling is found f among fallen sticks and twigs with a pocket knife used to help them break them down. And then we have his cat friend pulling the load for him. Day 11, foraging. Most Lilliputians are able to forage their daily needs and young villager and traditionalist Lilliputians learn to identify edible from poisonous at an early age. While fall is a great time to forage, spring and summer have plenty of bounty and they're collecting mush uh, acorns here. And I also wanted to not kind of repeat too many topics from prior Lilliputian livings. So we have the mushroom hunters in the first volume. So you might, guys might see a lot of acorn stuff in this one. It's me trying to make sure that I keep the topics more diverse so that they don't fall in too much with, you know, past Lilliputian livings. Day 12, cooking. While there are some Lilliputian taverns and bakeries, most Lilliputians cook for themselves and their families. Lilliputians are taught the basics at an early age so they can help around the house and later fend for themselves. And for most of these, you guys will notice I have a thumbnail sketch on a post-it and that kind of drives what the, the main sketch is going to look like. Day 13, walking the mouse. Pet mice get bored staying inside the house all day and enjoy walks and romps through the grass. Be careful, an overenthusiastic mouse might slip its collar and get away. And then here are some of the things needed for mouse care. So we've got some seeds, we've got corn, we've got blackberries, we've got the food and water bowls, we've got the brushes to take care of the mouse.
day four, actually, I think this is day 13. No, day 14 chores, drawing water from the cistern. And this one was fun because I got to draw on some of the concepts that I came up with originally for Seven Inch Kara, how they would live their daily lives, water storage and collection, especially clean water storage and collection could be a really important issue. Not so much in Louisiana, but you know, depending on where you live, having access to clean potable water can be a really big deal. So designing a cistern system was a lot of fun. Different communities have different water systems, but even if fresh flowing water is available, it may be dangerous for tiny Lilliputians to collect. Cisterns can be built out of readily available materials and used to collect rainwater. And this one was fun because it's a two-part system, so there would be a funnel or another can with wire mesh on top of it, higher up, maybe on top of this structure here. And then a lot of it would collect either into this can or into a series of cans, kind of depending on their needs. And then it's been fitted here with a water spigot so they can draw it as needed. Day 15, mending. Although seamstresses and tailors do a lot of trade, the ability to mend your own clothes is a vital skill taught to all Lilliputian children. Mending or renewing extends the lifetime of clothes. Day 16, preserving and canning. While refrigeration and cold storage for Lilliputians isn't completely unheard of, it's uncommon. So to put food by for leaner months, most Lilliputian adults practice canning, drying, pickling, and jamming perishable foods. And at this point I have actual internet access again. I have more stability in my schedule. I know that at least for some point in the evening, I can count on being able to sit down and draw, although I'm still trying to cram the sketches in whenever I have free time. So I think I was able to start improving from this point on because instead of just focusing on just get the thing done, I was able to focus on how I wanted to depict the concepts and how I wanted to handle the inking. And I think from here on, it mostly improves. That was another thing I was kind of frustrated frustrated by is that I know the art for this year's Lilliputian living isn't as strong as I might have wanted it to be, but considering I was, <laughs> I had kind of an uphill struggle just to get any of the prompts done, I'm really proud that I managed to finish all 31 days. Day 17, laundry. If, you're, if you are a particularly canny Lilliputian, you can probably expedite the process, but most Lilliputians end up drying laundry the old fashioned way. Fortunately, smaller pieces of laundry take far less time to dry. And she's lost her ribbon. This is one I really, really like. This is one where I also had internet access. So it, it, the theme is shopping. I don't have a prompt for this one written yet, but it's based on a farmer's market stall. And I was able to draw all of the, the foods and the seedlings that Lilliputians might commonly eat and have a sunflower kind of casting shade like a giant umbrella. So we've got kumquats, we've got lima beans, we've got sprouts, we've got blueberries, blackberries, strawberries, cherry tomatoes, jalapenos, sweet peas, sunflower seeds, baby onions, black eyed peas, baby spinach. Over here we've got green peas, pea, green peas or radish. He's got bread and cheese in his basket and then we have some more sprouts for them to plant and possibly start their own garden.
So day 19 is housework and cleaning, feathers tied to sticks to help dust the ceiling, a straw broom for the floor, and vinegar with water to clean smudges off a of glass. After a long winter, things tend to get really dusty. And day 20, house maintenance. Even if you live in the trunk of an oak tree, there's still regular maintenance that goes into a Lilliputian home. And he's attempting, not doing so well, to paint his front door. And this one was a fun one for me because I get to draw art supplies, which I love drawing art supplies. So at this point, I start having more time than I, I can actually put into both drawing and inking. So they are going to get a little bit more elaborate from here, which is good. I really want to use Lilliputian Living as a chance to draw a variety of people and draw a variety of backgrounds and kind of draw a variety of concepts while still doing this world building. So being able to kind of stretch and spend more time into it is nice. It's a nice thing to be able to do. Some artists can devote the whole day to their Inktobers or their Arttobers or, you know, their October drawing challenges. There's been years where that was something, a luxury I had, uh, but many artists have very minimal time that they can put into this. And that kind of makes it an added challenge because you're, you're really trying to shoehorn it in there. And I found that it took about 30 minutes for me to do the sketch and then 45 minutes to an hour and a half for me to do the inking itself, which is not a huge amount of time, but you know, you do need to be able to concentrate. You do need to have a steady hand while you're inking. You know, there's certain things that you need to kind of create a space and an environment where you can actually do the work. And if you're working from, you know, a variety of migration scenarios, or if you're bringing your sketchbook with you in the car or while you're attending doctor's visits, it definitely ups the challenge level. So um, it definitely made me appreciate what many of my students and younger friends who are, if they're doing this challenge this year, you know, they're bringing it with them to school, they're bringing it with them as they ride in the car, they're spending whatever free time they can to put into this. It definitely makes me appreciate where they're coming from, especially the people who worked in full color this year. That's just so impressive to me. So day 21, attending class. While some Lilliputian children are homeschooled or schooled at a home in small groups, villager children often attend Attend, bleh, often attend school together as a class. All village children of school age attend class together, but many schoolrooms have access to secondhand human tech, and village Lilliputians are much more savvy than they seem. So we've got the smartphone, and we've got the tablet. I thought that would be kind of a fun inclusion because when I'm doing Lilliputian living, unless I'm drawing like mall Lilliputians, they all tend to look kind of more old fashioned, just kind of hailing back to when people were creating their own patterns and sewing their own clothing and kind of scavenging what they could to make clothing out of. So it's kind of fun for me to mix in modern tech in there too, as just like a reminder, like you're not looking at Little House on the Prairie, you're looking at tiny people existing in the modern world. Day 22, dropping off packages with a messenger. While many messengers do door-to-door -door service and packages and letters may be exchanged then, many messengers set up in the village and accept outgoing mail right before a trip to another settlement. And my idea for this one is that the older sister, who is vaguely Bulma-inspired, has kind of like 
convinced her younger brother to drop off a package so she can flirt with the messenger. And then we have his pet weasel here. I don't know why people think weasels aren't cute. They're super cute. And then day 23, dancing. As far as hobbies go, most Lilliputians don't get many chances to dance with a partner, but many enjoy dancing at home. So we have her dancing with a Bluetooth speaker playing music while her frog pets are just hanging out and enjoying the music. For day 24, we have playing music. In volume one of Lilliputian Living, we have musicians. So those would be professional musicians who go from village to village or settlement to settlement and play music. These would just be people who are enjoying playing music for fun. And I don't know how I drew that harmonica backwards because I played harmonica for seven years. You guys could tell this was inked when I was tired, but that's just an excuse. In the finished version, I'll probably just edit that out so that's not noticeable. So while there are traveling professional musicians who sing and play for trade in their supper, many Lilliputians play for enjoyment. Popular instruments include penny whistle, harmonica, and bell tambourine, although generally not an ensemble. Day 25 is picnic. So we've got a young couple just kind of out enjoying the spring weather. They've got some homemade nut cheese. They're drinking probably a Lilliputian version of Switchel or maybe even a homemade wine. They've got some blueberries. They've got acorn bread. They've got blueberry cobbler. They have probably a thin soup or broth over there, probably made from vegetables. So while doing Lilliputian living, I had these horrible, horrible migraines, which is not surprising. People still have half their houses out on the street getting water damage while we're waiting for, you know, the city to come and pick everything up. So I'm not really surprised that I was having these really bad migraines. Usually though, I would still do my Lilliputian living anyway, but on day 20, 25 or 26, I ended up with a migraine so bad that I just couldn't. I couldn't draw. I couldn't ink. So I took the day off and ended up spending one extra day in November catching up, which isn't really a big deal. But that inspired me to draw sick day because even Lilliputians get sick. I'm sure many Lilliputians even have things like migraines, which, you know, technically you could work, but it's pretty debilitating. So this one <laughs> was inspired by my own sick day issues. She's got her pet mice, keeping her company, snuggling with her. And it was kind of a chance to, you know, decorate a bedroom. So we've got a Mardi Gras doubloon from Cleo. We've got a bobcat stamp and we've got a flower stamp here. We've also got some hot tea, some cool, clean water and some herbs in the background for her. So for, for daily life, there were so many things that I wanted to cover. And if this month had just been a different month, if my life had been a different life during this month, I would have extended it an extra 15 days to cover some of their holidays and just more aspects of their daily life. But this year was struggle bus, so that's okay. So for the last part of Lilliputian living, this kind of ended up being my, maybe my favorite part. I started designing you know, different types of rooms. And I really would have liked to have explored this more and fleshed this out more. But again, 2021 is just not my year. But I discovered I actually really enjoy drawing tiny environments without having to focus on drawing the people in them. So that might be something I explore more in the future. So this is bedroom. And for this one, I wanted to draw this kind of a very loved, almost spoiled little girl who has kind of a privileged Lilliputian child life. So she has a really nice room for a Lilliputian kid. She doesn't have to share it with anybody. It's not, you know, a bed in the corner of a shared space. It's a room just for herself. And she's got a very cute dollhouse bed and she's got some children's jewelry boxes as her furniture and children's tea sets, you know, for her to wash her face. And she's got toys. She's got like a mini color pencil set and she's got Legos and she's got bouncy balls and she's got a cute little pet gecko and he even has his own bed and this doily took 
forever. So Kara has a doily on the floor of her room as well. And I normally don't, because it's a comic, I don't render it out quite this much. The doily alone took about 45 minutes. I'm really happy with how it turned out, but whoo, this is why I shorthand doilies for my comics. And for, for Lilliputian Living, when I have the ability to access reference, I usually do pick real world objects and put them into the world so it feels more believable. And I've talked about this in a lot of my watercolor tutorials where even though I have a cartoony style, I really heavily reference things because I want to add those elements of realism. Like it would be cool to me if you looked at this room and you could see several objects that, you know, not just like a doily, like, oh yeah, I know what a doily is, but like you recognize, like maybe you recognize the stamps, except these are all French flower stamps. So maybe not, or you recognize the vintage Little Red Riding Hood postcard, or you recognize the Pottery Barn children's jewelry boxes, or, you know, I, my goal is that you see things from your own life that you recognize, and you see them kind of repurposed by Lilliputians. So that's one of my goals, and it's one of the reasons I really like to rely heavily on reference rather than my, for, for you know, set design, rather than just relying on my imagination, because I want you guys to see things maybe from your own lives that you guys recognize. So the next room, uh, yeah, next room is greenhouse. And this is really cool because something else about Lilliputian Living is I get to really tie in all of my weird niche interests that I generally never get to talk about with people. I get to tie them in and kind of use them to flesh out this world. So I can really kind of make my mark on it. And it's one of the reasons I think this challenge is so fun. And it's why I choose to do my own prompt list rather than working from existing prompt lists is because it allows me to share my interests with other people. I come from a family of farmers and gardeners and I I kill most things I plant or at least I used to kill most things I planted in Nashville I seem to be having some better luck now that I'm back in Louisiana but I do have a lot of interest in gardening and farming and growing food to consume or having not just decorative plants but plants that produce things that are useful and edible so Lilliputian Living and 7-inch Care are a great opportunity for me to bring that interest in and just kind of have it in the background so this is a milk carton greenhouse this is actually something you can do although most people cut it from the top over and that way they can flop it over you can also do the same thing with water bottles so They've set up a more permanent greenhouse solution where they can get some sprouts started. They also have some sprouts going in a bit of cardboard egg crate, which is also something you can do. And then since the egg crate, the cardboard egg, egg crate specifically is biodegradable, you can then plant that. You can also do it in eggshells, which I think is really cool. And then they've also got some plants kind of training up on toothpicks. And then in the background, we have a mini trellis with a cucumber plant growing. And from the greenhouse to the cellar. And this is this one was another one that was really fun for me because it was like the farmer's market where I'm working with a couple of existing images are my main reference. We have kind of the subterranean hand dug cellar that has these really large stodgy shelves in it and a little bit of wine cellar in there too. So I'm working with like two or three reference images, but I'm populating it and populating at a Lilliputian scale with things they would have. So we have like a bag of rice or grain. We've got some cheeses wrapped up. We've got some dried green peas. We've got some dried strawberries. We've got a large bottle of jam. And I had really had fun with this one because I was doing the texture on the jar and uh, coloring it black really makes that highlight pop. We've got some blueberries to keep for later. We've got some herbs. We've got a bunch of minnows. We've got some pearl onions. We've got a bunch of split green peas and yellow peas and then lentils. And then we've got lots of jam up there and carrots and little red 
potatoes, and then we've got some dried beans at the bottom. And this is kind of where I realized that I really enjoy drawing Lilliputian environments without worrying about having the Lilliputians in them. So refrigeration isn't an option for most Lilliputians. So those who live above sea level, so not Louisiana Lilliputians, make use of cellars for cold or at least cooler storage. And I know if you can get like six feet underground, the ambient temperature year round is like 60 degrees, which is plenty cool enough for storing a lot of vegetables. Now, are they getting six feet underground? Mm, maybe, it depends, it depends. And also some Lilliputians live a subterranean life anyway, kind of like hobbits. So maybe the cellar for them would just be a little bit lower than their regular dwelling. And it might be nestled in among, you know, tree root leaves, which are tree roots, which I tried to depict a little earlier on in this one. So vegetables, fruits, fish and meat and grains are kept in subterranean cold storage for leaner times. I had so much fun with A30. So this is a Lilliputian garden and it was cobbled together from so many reference images. There was, so I didn't like find a specific garden image and I was like, I'm just going to draw that. I already had an idea for how I wanted to lay out the garden because again, gardening is one of my interests and I just got to populate it with all the kinds of plants they would find useful. So we have a log of shiitake mushrooms. We've got watercress, which I learned from researching this. This used to grow in my childhood backyard all the time. And I mean, I tasted it, but I was like, oh, it's just crunchy grass. Um, but it's watercress and it's edible, so that's pretty cool. Um, in the front, we have lavender, we have sage over here, we have mint, we have dill, thyme, parsley, oregano, we have chives in the background, and these are the chive blossoms, those would be purple. We have mustard greens way at the top, and then we have basil. So, and then of course we have moss and, and stones because it wouldn't be a Becca illustration without moss being in there somewhere. And then just as a hint for the scale, I went ahead and I drew a basket with some of the thyme in it. And so a little bit of the watercress kind of hidden at the bottom with a hat. But this one was a lot of fun for me. And I actually really want to paint this. I think this would make a beautiful postcard. And then finally for day 31, we have bathroom and kind of like with the little girl's room being kind of like an opulent example of a children's room for Lilliputians this is a really opulent example of a bathroom for Lilliputians I mean most Lilliputians are <laughs> not living this high life restroom and bathroom accommodations among Lilliputians range wildly from a hole in the ground away from camp to somewhat plumb facilities depending on the family's plumbing skill level access to materials and interest in interior plumbing so like Kara's family would have an outhouse or um, would find kind of a secluded corner and dig a latrine. They don't have interior plumbing where they actually have like a water closet that you can pull and it would actually flush. This family, obviously they have electricity. They've decided to, to go the fancier route. Um, and, and their plumbing would just probably drain to a ditch, which I know is gross, but teeny tiny poops, not big human poops, not quite as bad. So this bathroom, this is based off of a teacup my grandmother gave me. And these are vintage glass jewelry boxes. And this is an oven mitt. And uh, the rest of it, I kind of just, uh, these are from tea sets, just kind of cobbled from either a uh, dollhouse furniture reference or from thin air. And I really wanted to kind of push like, this is an opulent bathroom for a Lilliputian. So we have like a fancier mirror. And we've even got a little bit of, this would probably be washi tape in reality up at the top of the ceiling to make it a little bit more decorative. And we've got fancy stamps and we've got a window looking out onto an ivy plant. I mean, this, this person lives the high life. And that would be all 31 days of Lilliputian living for 2021.
would be all 31 days of Lilliputian living for 2021. I hope y'all had an easier time with your art challenges this month if you decided to do one. Uh, some of these, you know, when I'm when I'm doing this kind of thing, especially this year, this year I had to remind myself like this is a sketchbook, these are inked sketches, because you guys have seen that I have a tendency to print them out and redraw them a little bit and then use them for field tests. So I had to kind of remind myself on the days where I didn't do as good of a job as I'd hoped if I was kind of disappointed in myself, because a lot of the earlier ones, the only time I had time to draw and ink them was like 11 o'clock at night, which is not really the best time for me to be starting something. Um, I had to just kind of remind myself that like this one, this one didn't turn out as cute as I'd hoped it turned. The, the perspective in a lot of these is also kind of funky because I was just kind of cramming it in there when I could. It's like fake two point or one point, but the perspective lines just don't add up and normally they would. So I had to just kind of remind myself that these are sketches and that if they're, oh, this one, this one, this one I'm like, because the, the perspective for this one is just all, all wrong, all made up. Um, I did just kind of remind myself that these are ink sketches and that if there's any that I really love, I can print them out, re-ink them, and paint them, and that'll kind of give them, you know, a new lease on life. But I, this was not an easy one. There were some I really enjoyed doing, and then there were some that it was like, I was just, Try, just trying to get it done for the day. But I'm really proud that I did finish all 31 days this year. It was harder than in past years. And you know the response this year to Lilliputian Living just wasn't really what I was hoping for. So maybe I'll do it next year, maybe I won't. I was hoping to get two full print volumes. So speaking of print volumes, volume one through four of Lilliputian Living has been comp compiled into a single perfect bound book. Some of these are all new, like uh, the back half of the book. So volume three and volume four, they're new. I think volume four, yeah, volume four has never before been in print. So this is the first time it's in print, whereas volume one through three have been available as mini comics and zines. So if you are intrigued by the Lilliputian world, if you wanna spend more time in it, or if you just enjoy a bit of cute world building, you guys can find this in the Natto shop and I'll put a link down in the description below. But I was hoping to have, I was hoping to get another four years out of this so that I'd have two volumes, two like compendiums. But uh, after this year, you know, I, I don't know about that. We'll see. So that about wraps up Lilliputian Living 2021, at least for now. I'm sorry for some of the audio and technical glitches in this video. For some reason, this one was just really a challenge to edit together. It fought me almost as hard as the challenge itself fought me, but I hope you guys enjoyed it. And, you know, let me know if you'd be interested in me continuing Lilliputian Living, or if in the future you'd like me to share my prompt list ahead of time and you'd like to draw along with me. So I'm going to have links to where you guys can check out not only the original Lilliputian Living, but this year's Lilliputian Living down in the description below, the materials that I used, and let me know in the comments if you guys want to see more Lilliputian Living next year. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me and for watching this. I hope it brought a smile to your face, and I hope to see you guys again soon. Bye, guys.